I'm very proud to present uh, one of the most exquisite suits that you will ever see. There are different levels of suits and there's different things that impact the price point of a suit. One of the things that most impacts the price point of a suit is the fabric. And so our good friends at Dorme and their CEO, Richard, who came to our LGG company meeting, introduced us to a fabric that is exquisite and exclusive and frankly, one of the most um, luxurious fabrics that's ever been created. What they did is they took the jade stone which in the Asian culture represents wealth and prosperity and longevity. Fortune, good fortune. Good fortune. Uh, and they took that jade stone, they crushed it into a fine powder, and then they blew it into the weaving machine as the cloth was being spun to create a thread that's, uh, that's comprised of not only wool, but the jade itself. The essence of jade spun right into the cloth and then spun into a suit. You want to talk about price? If you've got an extra $26,000 lying around, and you want something not many people have, it would be the jade suit. Uh, there are other precious materials you can get in the suit. Uh, now we have 24 karat stripes in like gold stripes on a suit. We have platinum, which is beautiful, has a sort of silvery kind of a look to it. And uh, there, there you can get silver, of course, sort of like, you know, spun into the stripes and you can get, uh, you can get diamond weave as well. We have a diamond, a crushed diamond that goes into the cloth, but jade is new and specifically why? Diamond's been around longer than jade for cloth manufacturing. This is one of the newest things that exists today, pushing the boundaries of innovation and luxury and really targeted towards that Asian demographic, which is one of the largest demographics in the world today for consuming luxury cloth. There's a certain opulence that goes on with the Far East, especially when it comes to bright colors and, and just representation of wealth. So this is a very special garment. Uh, now, Dan, tell us what a suit like this and what its meaning also means to you. Well, to me, this is a money suit, right? Definitely is money. Uh, greens also represent money in, in the Asian culture as well. Uh, first of all, I want to say this is very, very comfortable. Very light, very comfortable. Uh, the material, it feels, it looks heavy, but it's actually probably one of the lightest suits out of all the suits that I, I've been trying today. So. I love the story, love the material, and how many people have this in the world? Not many. Maybe less, maybe less than a dozen, really. I mean, we've made a couple, but it's like, it's so exquisite and so exclusive. Uh, and I think it really is meant for somebody that is a token of, you know, the suit for you is like a token of your achievement and there's nothing to be ashamed about. It's a proud thing. It's like, you should be proud of the price that you've paid to be successful. And the suit is a reminder, a reminder that we were brainstorming particularly we want this to be a three piece not a two piece and, and why well so there's a couple of reasons uh let me start with this a three piece suits offer you a three piece suit offers you more versatility so for example you can wear the pants and the vest without the jacket so for example on a business casual day you just go vest and jacket vest and pants you can also wear the vest without the jacket or pants so if you have like a pair of uh, chinos or jeans you can do a nice dress shirt with jeans and the vest. So you have another look there that's a little bit below business casual, but still office appropriate, let's say. You can wear it as a two-piece suit on a very, very hot day. Additionally, you can interchange the vest. So for example, with an earth tone suit like this, you can change the vest. You can wear a navy vest, a black vest, any color vest would look and create a completely different outfit for the suit. Let's talk about color, earth tone. So green is an earth tone color. So with earth tone jackets, you don't wear white shirts. Why? Well, I'm going to show you guys. Stay here for a second. If I take a white, and I'm just going to hold a white jacket here. If I hold white against green, it kills the green. It turns the green into like a gray. So you don't want to do that. You want to highlight the fact that you have an earth tone suit. So you have a green. And earth tone is usually your fifth or sixth suit. Now, I'll say it's your sixth suit because you should have a navy solid, gray solid, navy stripe, gray stripe. Then you need a black. You need a black suit. And then you're going to think, okay, am I going to buy a tuxedo? which we'll talk about, or am I going to go with an earth tone suit? Why would you have an earth tone suit psychologically in your wardrobe? So here's why. Then in sales, do you sometimes get a client that's not very happy? We do. Look, we all do. Look, there's no product in the world that has been delivered 100% on time, 100% on spec, 100% of the time. We know that if you're selling software, you know that sometimes the user features are not as you wish they were. Or for example, there's a service thing on the back end. Salespeople have to learn to confront negative situations. I get a lot of people in sales. They're like, oh, I just want to make people happy. And I say, get out of sales, get out of sales. Like it never happened. It never happened. Like nobody's going to be happy 100% of the time with the same exact thing. So sometimes as a salesperson, you have to admit that you are stepping into a no win situation. And this is a great time to wear a brown or a green 
It's a great time to wear an earth tone because an earth tone is an appeasement color. It's a I take responsibility color. You're not trying to outstatus somebody. Like if you have a negative situation, you walk in in a blue pinstripe suit, you're sending the wrong message. It's worse. It gets worse. You're like, you're, you're trying to continue to hammer down, not the time to do it. Uh, earth tone is a great time to apologize to your wife. Okay, but seriously, earth tone suits are a great suit in order to appease, to calm. I tell lawyers, you're going to go into a, a trial, like a litigation conclusion, so you're, and the judge is going to hand down the verdict, or the jury is going to hand down the verdict. Do you think you're going to win? And he says, you know what? I'm not so confident about this. Wear an earth tone. Wear an earth tone. Psychologically, you're going to reduce the sentencing amount for your client. Right. That's not nothing. Yeah. And you want to look, and like at, this, at that level, like 1% of a difference is a big difference. So an earth tone suit is a wonderful suit. So for example, you mentioned your mentor. Who is that? Uh, Dan Pena. Okay. So Dan Pena is a pretty, well, aggressive dude. And he's in your face and he likes bold and, you know, it's all his personality. If I'm going in for a first time meeting with Dan Pena, I might wear a stripe to show him that I'm worthy of his time. But if I'm going to be mentored by him, I might not want to push back and tell him I'm better. That's not why I'm there. I might want to wear an earth tone to show him, hey, man. It's I'm almost a little bit more humble. It's humble. Yes. Like I want to listen. I want to take it in. I want to absorb and I want to learn. And so an earth tone suit is an absolute necessity in your wardrobe if you have those situations, which if you're successful, you will fail and you will need an outfit for that. And don't feel bad about it. Nothing wrong with being humble, especially in a $26,000 suit. So uh, another use for earth tone, it's a great color to wear. And I'm sorry this will sound sardonic, but it is true. It is a great color to wear when you need to lay somebody off. When you have layoffs, you want it. It's a humble color. It's a color that says, I emphasize with you. So it's a good color to wear when you're firing somebody. When you're castigating an employee for making an error, a great suit to wear is an earth tone suit. But we don't know anything about that, do we? Wink, wink. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity to wear. Uh, by the way, and let me say this too, to all you salespeople and business people, you know this already, but I'm going to say it. It is a privilege. It is a privilege to sometimes deliver bad news because you don't trust low-level people with bad news. So as much as, you know, like my father-in-law is a heart surgeon, he has to deliver bad news. And, I, and when I have to deliver some bad news, I honestly take that as a privilege because my bad news is not as bad as his bad news. But I know that people trust me with bad news, and that's a big thing to trust people with. This is the suit for that. How do you wear a vest on a three-piece suit? It's very simple. So you want to leave the bottom button undone. So on every suit you own, pay attention, unless it's a one-button suit, a two-button suit, a three-button suit, we have a four-button suit or a six-button Nehru jacket or a vest, you leave the bottom button undone. Same on a double-breasted suit. The bottom button stays open. Okay. So the question people would ask is like, what's the difference between like a $600 suit, a $6,000 suit, and a $26,000 suit? Okay, well, first of all, the fabric. Like you're not going to get, look, you're not going to get a jade crushed into your wool for a $600 suit or even a $6,000 suit. The fabric itself is worth more than that. So the rarity, the luster, the wearability, the exclusivity of the fabric is contingent on its own price. I mean, that's just what happens. The price is going to be dependent on the luxury of the cloth. Uh, very few mills in the world, in fact, only one that I know of can even make this cloth, and we're one of the few companies that even have access to it. We're the first. So the fabric is very important to the exclusivity and the price of a suit. The next thing is the construction. So a lot of times when you wear a cheap suit over a period of time, they start to lose its shape. The reason they start to lose the shape is because the chest piece is not done properly. It's baked in an oven instead of being hand dried or being dried in a room you know for 24 hours there's also the stitching component machine stitching versus hand stitching a suit like this you don't want to have it machine stitched does this suit feel i don't know more comfortable yeah very comfortable so uh alice cooper had a suit made by us as well which was hand stitched uh and the hand stitching especially is important through the armholes area like this the shoulders the armholes because it feels like you can move a little bit better here's why a machine is going to stitch very precisely but very tightly with with very little ability to sort of dissipate the threads they sort of stay tight over the lifetime of the suit but hand stitching is not as tight and there's something tailors can do which great salespeople can do see you can write a nice script but depending on who reads it the result is different a tailor works the same way when they feel the fabric when they see the measurements when they feel the cloth they combine those elements together to create an artwork. They go, okay, the cloth has this much stretch, so I need to make it a little bit tighter here. The pattern is cut like this, so I need to make it a little bit looser there. 
And so they have in mind a finished piece of art. And so like a salesperson delivering a script can get different results from a different salesperson delivering the same script. There is an artistic element to this. More hand workmanship means more money because why? Well, I'll tell you guys why. There are so few tailors left in the world today that can construct the suit from bottom to the top from the start all the way through. That is a dying art. I believe in 30, 40 years, you might not even be able to get a suit made by a real human being. That is, it's like, get, get shoes made by hand. We have handmade shoes, good luck. There are so few people in the world, it's like sales. There are so few people in the world left that really know the art of sales, right? Because we're teaching it to machines. We're teaching everything to machines. So there's a price to pay for that. It's an exclusivity that if you have a kid, like, you know, when I pass my handmade suits to my son, he might not be able to wear my suits, but at least he'll be able to say that was handmade for my dad. Like it'll be, it'll, it might be just like a piece of art being passed down. It's just one of those things. So you have the construction and you have the fabric that is contingent, that creates the contingency for the suit is priced. But there's one other element and that's the actual inner guts of the suit. Let me tell you guys a little bit about that. Our chest pieces are made in Italy. They're made in Italy. I talk about it in another video because of the way that the buildings that are constructed, single story. The chest pieces come from Italy. The best place in the world to get chest pieces. Our shoulder pads come from Helsa in Germany. We have a German shoulder pad in our suit because it's the best shoulder pad in the world. And there's one factory in the world, the Helsa factory, that owns the entire industry when it comes to making the best shoulder pads. Uh, the waistbands in our suit also come from Germany. They use some of the same materials you're going to find in like an Austin Martin, which is like adhesive materials on the waistband, which is not rubber, but still sticks to cotton. So you have this little strip inside the pant uh, where the shirt actually doesn't become untucked, but it also doesn't melt the waistband when it gets dry cleaned. So it's a very special material that we use. These things matter, right? These little things matter. YYK zippers, the best zippers in the world. Uh, so the inside materials that are used to construct the garment also play effect on the price. Now, imagine you're a cheap salesperson. You don't want to be that. You want to be a high tech closer. And all you're competing on is price all the time. What's going to happen to you? Well, you live by price, you die by price. Yes. Right? And the problem with when you're competing on price at any given moment, example, Someone buys from you because you offer lower or lowest prices. If that's the only reason they're buying from you, it means anyone could come in any time. So the advantage that you have, hey, people buying from me, anyone can come anytime and just take their customers away. Because someone comes and says, hey, I'll, I'll give you 10% off. That customer is gone because that's the reason why they bought from you in the first place. So instead of leading with lower prices, you want, you want to lead with value. Value, yes. You want to lead with value. Across any industry, you will look at, let's say the airline industry, you have economy, your business class, and your first class. And then you will see uh, airline, they make the most amount of money from the first class and business class, yes. not the economy, right? You look at uh, a, a sports game, a, a concert, front row seats, VIP seats, or sometimes backstage seats, right? And then they have the mid, and then they have the very far, 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 far mm -hmm. front. Different prices, same concert. Yeah. So I think most people, they are too lazy and sometimes, sometimes business owners and salespeople, they're too lazy to think about and figure out how could I sell at a higher price instead of just, I'll just lower my price and maybe someone would buy from me. They're trying to solve a marketing problem, lack of demand with a pricing solution, which never works. Well, there's two things that I see that's really wrong with that. First of all, imagine that you have clients that spend a lot on your product and clients that spend a little. Who creates the most problems for you? Problems always are cheap and, and, and no yeah. ticket clients. The cheap clients are always a problem. They always complain about everything. It's like, why? Well, because, because they, so they don't even see the value. They complain because they don't see the value. So. I tell people, it's like, I have clients complaining about my product. I'm like, good, double the price. They go, what? Go double the price. Look, if you double the price and you lose half your clients, how much revenue do you have? The same. same. You double the price, you lose half your clients. But now you have the half of your clients are great clients. They don't waste your time. And now you have double the time to get more great clients. Yep. That's the first issue. The second issue, and now I'm going to, again, I like to equate sales to mating. It's the same thing. Watch this. You say, why don't I just lower the price? Well, let's imagine that you want to take a girl out on a date. And instead of making yourself better, you're like, I'll just spend twice as much money on her. So what happens when you spend less money on her? She leaves for the guy that spends more money. You're competing on losership, not value. You want to, as a salesperson, create more value in your product instead of lowering your product's price 
lowering your rate of pay for your product and lowering your value, getting more complaints. There's no victory in competing on price. No, and I always say that no one searches for the cheapest heart surgeon in my city. When it, when it comes to something important yeah. in life, people want the best. People want what works. They don't want the cheapest. I'll tell you guys a cheesy story because it goes with the suit. So back in the, about 2013, I was in Calgary and I went to the Ferrari dealership because there was a Maserati I wanted to buy. Love this car. This was like this like classic Maserati. And I was just like, Mwah. like, I just want to, I just imagined myself driving it. And I work really hard. Told my wife, I'm like, that's the car for me. And 2013 comes around, I'm buying it. Walk into the dealership. They give me a price and I'm looking at this car. And like the guy knows I want it. He knows that I know I want it. Everybody in the room knows I want it. And I go, okay, I'm going to drive this car out of the dealership today. And here's the price I'm willing to pay. And I literally, I felt bad about negotiating because, you know, I'm sitting in a pretty prestigious dealership. I write down a price. I slide it over to him. He doesn't even look at the paper. He just takes it, scrunches, put it in the garbage. He goes, Dimitri, this is a Ferrari dealership. If you want a good deal, there's a Toyota across the street. I still drove out on that car that day. I paid the full ticket price they were asking for because he made me understand the value of where I was at that time. Um, and I'm going to help you guys understand the value of a $26,000 of a twenty-six thousand dollar suit. Well, it's more than just the suit. It's also the fact that you may as well be wearing a Maserati. Doesn't feel so bad, does it? Let's do a price check. How much is that watch? <laughs> this one? Yeah. Uh, 100000 $100,000 watch, $26,000 suit, million dollar wardrobe. Let's go. That's how it works. In terms of construction, there's different ways to construct a suit. Uh, in our language, we call it primo versus lusso in the more, let's say, traditional way people call half canvas and full canvas. But I don't like the half canvas and full canvas comparison because you can make a full canvas suit with cheap materials and it's still technically full canvas. It's like having an ugly blonde. Well, she's a blonde, but meh, you know. So I like the Lusso and I like, hey, I don't care. I like the Lusso and the Primo. Here we go. Primo, fully. So this would be a Primo garment. It is fully canvas, which means there's a four layer canvas with felt, interlining cloth and horsehair. And it's interwoven into the suit all the way through the bottom to maximize the shape and to maximize the longevity of the suit. Now there is a downside on a full canvas. You don't want it on a summer suit because it can get heavy and it can get wrinkly. This is an all year suit with a beautiful light fabric. So full canvas is fine. Lusso would be a half canvas construction, which is much more popular and much more everyday use, where you have the canvas that goes right down to just about the last rib. And then underneath that, it's a fusing. Or in our case, uh, it's not actually a pure fusing. It is uh, something more akin to uh, adhesive that has something like 300 micro micropixels per square inch. So rather than using a tape in order to hold the fabric to, to the inner lining, we use little tiny, 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 tiny dots which don't, uh, which don't melt or disperse when you put them in the dry cleaner. So our suit always maintains its shape forever. This is a much more expensive way to construct things. Very important. People will say, is the fused suit cheaper than half canvas? The answer is not always. Why? Because you can have the best fusing and the worst half canvassing and the fusing is better and by a lot. And so one of the things that you want to consider when buying from a tailor, like a lot of the Asian traveling tailors, so they're based in Hong Kong, they'll come into Canada or Australia and they'll sit down and say, oh, I can sell you a suit for $500. You don't know where it's made. The wool is quite often angora rabbit instead of sheep, which is a whole other topic. Don't go there. But there's also the issue that they say, well, it's half canvas instead of fused. And you'll look at it and say, well, which one's better? And they can't answer the question. The answer is really simple. And this is where reputation comes really handy. Like, why does Laura Piana charge so much for its fabric? Why does Tom Ford charge so much for suits? It's the reputation. They've worked so hard for such a long time to develop such an amazing reputation. And so people ask me, they say, Dimitri, where's your number one office? I'm like, in sales, it's Hong Kong. How is that possible? It's the place where suits are made. Because people there are educated on suits. They know product. They know product so well that when they look at our product, they go, wow, you guys really know your stuff. So then why do those tailors travel overseas? Because people don't know product. Reputation matters. Dan, here's a question for you. How much of your reputation versus how much, how hard you have to work now, how much of your business is now down on, done on reputation alone? I think reputation is, I believe, the most efficient business model. Mm. Right? Sure. When you have a good reputation, people come in, uh, they know you, like you, and trust you. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to do so much convincing of, hey, here's why you should do business with me. Here's why our company's good. They come in, there's someone that goes to your company. They know if they watch this video, they know the work that you've done. Hey, if you can make a $26,000 suit, 
I think you could take care of my 3,000 lawsuits or 4,000 lawsuits, yeah. right? Um, and they know your process and they know your philosophies. That's a reputation. If someone wants a $300 suit, they're probably not going to call you guys. You know what I mean? How much of your business now is inbound? Like you work hard, you called, you, you paid the price. How much of your business now comes to you? Mostly is inbound. Like all of it? Yeah, mostly it's insane. Is inbound. Mostly. And it's especially yeah. combined with social media, right? Yeah, but that's reputation. Yeah. So let, one last point on this point. How did you build your reputation? Uh, I say one person at a time. Right. So it's like subscribers on, on, on social media. How do you earn a subscriber? People say, how do I grow my social media? It's one person at a time. You earn that trust one person at a time. You add a little bit of value, mm. just like what we're doing today. Right. All the videos that we're making doesn't mean if they, it doesn't matter if they're going to buy a suit from you or not. Right. They're going to learn something, which I'm learning something from, mm. from what you're just teaching. They're learning something that they could, Hey, you know, if I want to buy a suit and now I know what is quality hmm. and I know how to tell the difference and I know what to expect from my tailor or what to tell my tailor. Well, that's adding value. That builds trust. That's reputation. And reputation is social proof on drugs. It's social proof on steroids. Like I remember uh, when Lennox Lewis, the great boxer, gave us an opportunity to make his wardrobe and he loved it and he told all his friends about it. Uh, Alice Cooper got in front of us and was like, based on what you did for Lennox, I want that. And then Dan, when we reached out to you, you had no idea who we were. Yes. But you went on our website, like, well, they dress rock stars and, and world champions. So yes. this is this is the best reputation. Best reputation. That's reputation. Yes. In sales, one of the things that I teach our salespeople is when you knock on a new door, don't forget to bring your old friends with you. Mm, that's a great that's a great look. And I always I always tell that. Like when I go into a sales situation, like who do they know that's already my client? And I want to make sure that they know, like that I tell them that they know who's already my client that they know. Because I'm borrowing my reputation that I've earned with somebody else and I'm bringing it to the new door with me. They don't know you, but they know someone yeah. that you have worked with. Sure. Past. And I'm sure that when I, you know, whenever the next celebrity comes along, the next influencer comes along and they ask themselves, you know, look, I can get clothing anywhere, but why would I get LGFG? And they'll see Van Locke and they'll say, you know what? This guy's legit. So in a way, you want to bring your old friends to all the new doors. That's a great piece of advice for salespeople. Yeah, I love it.